Josh Copen here. I'm the public relations specialist at the firm. Happy to be joined by one of our attorneys, Joshua Claiborne. Josh practices out of our Evansville, Indiana office. And before we get started, we want to say congrats. Just name one of the uh, most influential or however you want to label it, uh, Indiana 250. Correct, Josh, is the title. Correct. So that's yep. pretty cool. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate it. From the Indianapolis Business Journal. So uh, first of all, you're one of the most 250 influential people in all of Indiana now. Do you wield that power? Don't always believe everything you read in print, Josh. That's what I like to say. But no, I, I appreciate it. I won't turn it away. Uh, and uh, I'm just thankful uh, folks in our part of the state, uh, south of Indianapolis, get recognized. Awesome. Well, congrats yeah. again. And they can check that out on your profile and on our LinkedIn or Facebook pages as well. And one of the things we want to talk about, you've talked about this before, done a few podcasts and videos on it, and that is the ever-changing world of name, image, and likeness, NIL, and how it's affecting college. And you've written a blog on this, high school as well. So let's start with, I kind of described the name, but what is it? What does it mean? What is name, image, and likeness? Basically, the ability of student athletes to leverage their name, image, and likeness for sponsorships and other types of deals with nonprofits or for-profit companies that were previously not allowed under NCAA rules. The NCAA started to revisit their policy uh, last year in June 2021, um, and that revisit was accelerated when the Supreme Court handed out a decision in National Collegiate Athletic Association v. Alston, and that really opened the door to NIL deals by student athletes across the country to go out and get whatever they could uh, to ensure that their college experience um, was one that was profitable for them as well in many cases. Yeah, in the Austin case, uh, Jackson Kelly, if you don't know, corporate headquarters in Charleston, West Virginia, uh, Austin played at WVU and uh, was one of the spearheads of that. Did this, just real quick as a background, did this kind of come out of the O'Bannon EA Sports thing too? They kind of won that, and I kind of think that spearheaded this case. Yes, the, and this has really been in the works for a while. Some of it is attributed to the fact that a lot of folks make a lot of money off student athletes in college. And people just viewed that as inherently unfair that the college athlete wasn't getting to share in those profits. But as you can understand and imagine, I'm sure there are some constitutional issues at play as well. And that ultimately opened the door for um, the Supreme Court decision. Yeah, 9 no Supreme Court decision, which is rare, especially in this day and age. So for them to all say, you're getting this wrong was was a pretty big deal. If people don't know, part of the reason some uh, there's been this political swing to not just legally towards athletes, it seems to me is when you've got talk a billion dollar a year a year contracts, you know, for the Big Ten Conference and things like that. And these schools are going to get one hundred million dollars. Right. And the players are like, well, without us, you're not making. So that's kind of where this has come out of. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then now we have, and the coaches and the administration is saying, well, it's the wild, wild west. There's no rules. No one's enforcing anything. The NCAA isn't doing anything. That's what's being talked about. So you have a, you've had eight bills introduced in Congress or Senate. None of them have even got out of committee. And now there's talk of a ninth from a former football coach who's now the senator of Alabama, Tommy Tuberville, and then West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin played football. He's good friends with Nick Saban, Rich Rodriguez. So he has a good understanding of the game and what's going on. So take us through that, Bill, and what are some of the legalities you think? Um, now, I don't know how much is written yet of that bill, but what are some of the things they are trying to come up with? Well, some of the pending ones, um, some folks are trying to just put reasonable guardrails around what folks currently view as the wild, wild west. Uh, some of the bills, though, are trying to rein in these NIL opportunities to get back to where college athletics was before that truly kept it an amateur sport. Um, they're all quite fluid, and it's not even quite clear which can get out of 
uh, each House of Congress, which could get signed by the president. And then even if it gets that far, I think there are other questions as to whether Congress even has the authority to uh, regulate this sort of thing um, and, and whether it's a state-based uh, approach as well. So I think there are a lot of questions about what could happen. And, and for that reason, you know, there's a, I, I um, recommend a little bit of caution about you know, planning ahead too far, but it is good to know that uh, legislators at both the state and federal federal level are looking at ways they can rein in the NIL um, landscape as it currently exists. I believe there's another bill introduced by Senator Cory Booker as well. Correct? Uh, yes, correct. And, and what's the what's what's his bill looking at? It's a little bit more player friendly or athlete friendly, if I understand. Yes, it's more, um, and I think it's actually a, a bill of rights, basically, that would enshrine legislatively college athletes' ability to market their name, image, and likeness. So from a legal standpoint, what should people be c concerned about? We're, we're a law firm. We want people to understand there are legal ramifications with this. Again, each state kind of has different laws. They're not that different, but they are different. So how should people address this from a legal standpoint, both schools and, and the individuals trying to make money? Well, I guess as an initial matter, it's important to understand that in one way, shape, or form, NIL deals are here to stay. It is possible that they end up getting reined in to some degree, but I, I, I don't think the, the toothpaste will be put back in the tube, so to speak, as it relates to student-athlete NIL deals. And because we can expect those deals to continue to exist in some way, um, they are critical to a college university's ongoing success athletically. Um, if, if you are not structuring some sort of NIL opportunities for student athletes, or there is not some independent group doing that on behalf of your university, you're probably going to be left in the dust. And the better athletes in your conference are going to be going elsewhere. Uh, you know, there are a lot of coaches, a lot of administrators, and a lot of boosters who see this as dirty, as ruining the sport. And, I, and, I, and although I am sympathetic to that view, the reality is what it is, and I don't think it's going to change. And so the best thing to do is to um, adapt as best you can uh, within the rules. And so I think universities need to get on board with the idea of an NIL. Now, the existing rules from the NCAA, which are more than likely going to continue, state that these NIL deals cannot be made um, as a quid pro quo to play, nor can they be, be made based on performance. Um, now, you know, in reality, obviously, a lot of the folks who are running the NI, who are offering NIL deals, um, will will typically give it to the better players that they want to ensure stay at the school. Um, and I think that's just um, a, a, a likely result. But but it is important for folks to know that the technical rules are that that cannot be the uh, primary or main basis upon which these NIL deals are, are provided. I think the most common model that we're going to see, and we're already starting to see this, and that's called these NIL collectives. And that's a group of boosters or corporations that support the school athletic program starting their own pool of funds that they then give out to the college athletes for whatever purpose, whether that's to um, um, sponsor a not local or regional nonprofit or perhaps a corporation of some kind um, or on behalf of the collective or some other type of entity. But I think you increasingly see not necessarily ABC Corporation hiring a company to speak in its ads, although we do see that, um, and instead see boosters pooling their money together to have the biggest impact possible for these athletes. We're speaking with Josh Claiborne, a member here at Jackson Kelly, and he focuses on intellectual, intellectual property, renewable energy, utilities, commercial transactions, state and local government, and Certainly several of those tie in with what we're talking about in name, image, and likeness. Tell me about antitrust. I've heard people say that might be the only thing that calms this down. When, when Congress or state legislatures see, whoa, 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 you're making how much money and you're tax exempt, 
Could you see that ever changing? Well, I think there are two questions there. One is the taxes of status of the NCAA, um, which uh, probably is going to continue. I mean, the NCAA's mission remains a charitable one, um, but, you know, the, the players are making money. So I guess, you know, there's always the opportunity for some review there. There's a separate antitrust question um, and, and, and whether the NCAA has an unfair monopoly on on this and on the uh, ability of um, universities or conferences to set their own rules um, and, and in spite of whatever the NCAA might say. In the past, the NCAA received what's a quote-unquote quick look from courts, which generally assumed that the NCAA policies were in the best interest of preserving amateur college athletics. But this recent Alston decision denied the NCAA's for that sort of deferential review on antitrust violations. So um, going forward, uh, the NCAA is going to have to work a little harder to prove that whatever rule it's promulgating is not in violation of the antitrust Sherman Act um, and that there is still competition among amateur college athletics and the NCAA doesn't have a monopoly on it. They'll have to, they'll have to go work a little bit harder to prove that. Did this make things easier or harder in terms of that? Because now you have, and this isn't to slight the quote unquote non-revenue sports, but football and basketball is where the majority of this is coming from. Could you see this being helpful or hurting, uh, let's say the Olympic sports, rowing, tennis, volleyball, those would be considered Olympic sports, if you will. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the the, the, the crux of the Austin decision really came down on not whether it was legal or illegal to require amateur status, so to speak, but whether the entity that is doing that has the authority, making those rules has the authority to do it. And I think in the case of colleges and universities and conferences, the Supreme Court felt that the NCAA lacked that uh, uh, or, or at least was willing to reevaluate that uh, that approach. So, you know, it's hard to say in these situations of the Olympics or other types of amateur situations that that same sort of antitrust, of those same sort of antitrust concerns exist. But certainly for any attorney advising those entities, you would um, have to give a much deeper uh, review of them for sure. Okay, so what legal advice would you provide then to your client or to anyone who came to us going, uh, we're a collective or I'm a student athlete and I've got this opportunity. What's the best legal advice we can offer in this situation? Well, it, the, the, because it's the Wild West right now, I mean, there, there are so many different um, types of NIL deals that are starting to pop up. And in each one, you really have to be careful about um, – typical contractual concerns, possible employee, employee, em, employer relationships that you would likely want to avoid. And then, of course, you really have to be careful that you're not violating what NCAA rules do exist regarding NIL deals and uh, keeping those in place. Uh, but there are in any um, NIL deals a lot of intellectual property concerns as well to ensure that both the collective, the university, and the player are all retaining and getting, uh, keeping the rights that they want and need to need to retain. So, uh, the bottom line is, I think anybody dipping their toes in these NIL waters uh, need legal counsel. I need to uh, confer and consult with legal counsel who are familiar with these new rules. And it sounds like a wide range: transactional, tax, yes. anything like that. That they would they would want to have um, advice from attorneys on all those things. Well, Josh, thank you for this. I, again, we were excited to, to announce that you were named uh, one of the uh, Indiana 250 most influential business leaders in the state of Indiana by the Indianapolis Business Journal. Anything else about yourself people might not know? You well, know. I, you know, I guess as it relates to these issues, um, I am happy to talk with and assist people in navigating the NIL waters and uh, like I said, I think it's going to continue to be an important issue that I'm happy to help with. Well, Josh, thank you so much. You can go to www.jacksonkelly.com. You can find Josh Claiborne's uh, 
bio on there or call anyone at Jackson Kelly and they will get you in touch with an attorney, a qualified, experienced, uh, licensed attorney who can help you with these questions. Josh, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.